Since we're approaching 6.30, I'd like to get started. So first up will be Jennifer with a five minute period for introduction. All right. Good evening, Edgewater. How's everybody doing tonight? Woo! Yeah, come on, get the Woo! Changes in the air, folks. My name is Jennifer Parker. I've lived in Southeast Volusia since I was 13 years old. I'm a graduate of New Smyrna Beach High School. I went off to Florida State University, got my degree in communications and media studies, and came right back home to Cap to Volusia County to open up my first business. But to be honest, folks, it ain't my background that makes me the strongest candidate for you guys. It's who I am as a person and my values that makes me the strongest voice for all of you. See, I'm a wife, I'm a mother. I have three children, two of which attend elementary schools, and I'm the PTA president of their school, also on the school advisory committee and the DAC, which is the district advisory committee, so I'm all in when it comes to education. I'm a volunteer at my church with school-aged children and special needs children, and for the last several years of his life, I was the caretaker of my father before we lost him to Alzheimer's. So like all of you, I have struggled. I have been through the thick of it. You know, I, uh, I know what it's like to see your child slipping between the cracks. I know what it's like to have a parent that needs more help than you can give them. I've been with you guys as we watch these viable businesses close down on US-1. And I too have paid those outrageous utility bills and wondered when I'd make my last payment to where I officially own the company. And that, folks, is why I'm here today. Because I am one of you. I'm here today asking to you to give me the voice to lead you. So that way I can make sure that all of our voices are heard. Now I don't know about you, but I've been sold a lot of smoke and mirrors by politicians in the past. I've been tricked by people who said they stood for one thing when really all they stood for was getting more votes and making more money. Three months ago, I spoke in front of our council outraged by their deceit. How they could make such a big decision without us and without our input. And when I spoke, I said the problem is you're not afraid of us anymore. You're not afraid of the voters. And I told them that I would be back and we would be taking our city back. And folks, that's why I'm here today. I'm fulfilling that promise. Now, while I was angry that day, today I find myself hopeful. And not just because I'm here trying to change things, but because I saw people come out to those meetings the last few months, and I saw the council hear us. We, as a community, came together, and we said we would not accept the rental inspection program as it was written. And then the council heard us, and instead of shooting us down and saying, that's it, we already voted, they decided to table the matter, they workshopped it, they heard us out, and they made the decision to suspend it until they could remove the program in March. Now people, this is a big moment in Edgewater history because this means there is change and we have been heard. That means that change is in the air and as long as we stay united and we are present, we will continue to make the changes in Edgewater that we need, not just to survive, but to thrive. Mm. Now we aren't the only area having major infrastructure issues. Towns all over the U.S. are feeling the cuts from the government. But cities, especially in this county, are not paying their employees what they're worth. They're paying them what they can afford. As a result, we have city workers who are angry, exhausted, and broke. We have citizens who have questions and who have found it difficult to even understand the legislator being passed before them. And so then we have angry citizens, resulting in all-time morale low. So how do we move forward, folks? How am I going to bring it together a town that is healing? I'm going to do it with your help. As our new interim city manager said, a city needs to get in front of the development before the developers get in front of the city. We need to do a study on this development and find out how we can appropriately increase our impact fees and hold them responsible for improving our infrastructure before the homes go in. We need support for our business owners and entrepreneurs, and we need to give them incentives for building, restoring, or renovating properties on US-1 and Park Avenue. We need to better fund and promote our Parks and Rec Department so our children and our elderly and our citizens and children with special needs can have programs where that can fill them filled with life and they have new places to go. We need to protect our river now before it's too late. And most importantly, we need to stop all this bickering and stand up together to be present and to get it all done. I'm Jennifer Parker, folks, and I'm bringing a fresh perspective to the table to get you all the positive change that you want and deserve. I may not have decades of experience in this town and political scheme, 
but I do have experience in changing a city's ordinances and outlook, and I'm ready to put my experience, my enthusiasm, and my passion to work for all of you to make Edgewater a town we can all be proud of. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I'd like to direct the, the candidates' uh, direction to the front row. You will be receiving a one-minute index card, just as a reminder. Oh, yeah. You've got a minute left. Okay. Next up will be Kimberly. Good afternoon, Ashley. My name is Kimberly Kline, and I'm also running for Edgewater City Council District 2. Um, this is my first political run. I had never had any aspiration to be involved in politics. When we um, originally moved here in 1984, my father was involved. I was a teenager at the time, and it was before cell phones and beepers. And Monday nights or Tuesdays, my mother would say, honey, go down and get your father from City Hall and tell him it's time to come home. <laughs> and so um, I was outraged as well on October 26th when I watched the meeting and I too showed up in November um, to air my disgrace, if you will, um, for our city and the way that things had been handled. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I came to Edgewater in 1984. I am a 34-year resident of Edgewater. We own our home as well as our commercial property and two businesses in Edgewater. That's Kleinani Media and Yes Electric. Um, I began my career back in 1989 with the Daytona Beach News Journal, Penny Saver Division. I was with them for over 18 years. And during the course of my 18 years, I was responsible not only for management, but budgeting and fiscal responsibility. And um, at this point, I, after 20 or 18 years, had actually had the opportunity to um, be responsible for the growth with Hometown News. Hometown News had approached me to become their general manager. And at that time, I uh, launched four publications and 100,000 circulation after putting together a team of 50 individuals. So I know what it takes for startup, I know how difficult it is, and I'm used to running multi-million dollar businesses. And uh, that's what we're looking at here today. We've got a $54 million budget in Edgewater, and I have the assets to be able to run and manage that and make solid decisions. Uh, when we launched our own commercial uh, venture in 2010 with the electrical company as well as the media company, um, we have grown that from um, a, a home-based business to that of a small business in excess of a million dollars, and we are now responsible for putting over a half a million dollars into job creation right here in Edgewater, and we're pretty proud of that. In 2018, uh, we received a, an award from the UCF Incubator uh, after graduating for job creation. And uh, in addition to that, I've served on the YMCA board for 10 years, two years as a financial committee chairperson, and two years as a um, board chair. I also started uh, the first Friday night market in 2012, and in 2014 we rebranded that as EdgeFest that you know today. So my heart is in this community, and it is my passion to serve you, the residents, and do the very best job that I can do for you. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Next up, we have Gigi. Hi, I'm Gigi Bennington, and a lot of you know me. Um, I really don't. My, my experience goes, I've served a total of 13 years on the city council in various times. Back in the 80s, it was two-year terms. So I was there from 88 to, I mean, from 82 to 84, and then 88 to 90. Um, I stayed out of it in the 90s. And my business was growing, so I um, had to take care of that. Then um, I decided to get back in because I didn't like some of the things that the council was doing at the time. So in 2007, I was elected. Uh, I loved it. I was re-elected with no opposition for my second term, and I really don't know what year it was. They sort of all blended together. I had to um, retire or term out because the charter allows only uh, two consecutive terms. 
That's the only reason I left. I've been in this city since 1976. I have my own business. I'm a tax consultant. I've been doing that for about 35 years. Overall, I've got about 30 years experience with the city. I've served on charter review committees, planning boards. I've been um, a CAP, a Citizens Assisting Police Officer. I was uh, president of the Edgewater Police Volunteer Association. That's their volunteer where they can r uh, raise the money. And the, I've had a lot of people ask me, why are you doing this again? Haven't you had enough? But like him, I love, and, and Jennifer, I love this city. When we moved here, there were 3,000 people. Uh, it's unbelievable to see what it came, it, it is to now, and what it is going to it, um, be soon. What I bring to the table is experience. With me, you're going to have a tried and true person that you know as citizens the way I, what I stand for and the way I vote. I won't have a learning curve, which I don't care what anybody tells you. It's easy to sit out here and, and want to be on the council, but once you sit up there, it's a learning curve. And what this city needs now, I feel, is the stability. And I can offer the stability. I, I know the ins and outs. I've served with three of the council people in my prior service, so I'm well acquainted with them. Um, and here again, I, I, I want to see this city grow. My daughter was raised here, graduated at um, New Smyrna. My granddaughter graduated New Smyrna. My grandsons were born here. So I have deep roots in this city. I've been in the same house for the same for 43 years. <laughs> Um, so I've seen Florida Shores grow from, you could go for miles without seeing a house and dirt roads and we had a scraper that had to go all the time and scrape the roads and, uh, but I, I was uh, very proud of the accomplishments with what we've accomplished. We had the animal shelter, Parktown Industrial Park, one of the biggest um, industrial parks in Volusia County. Uh, renovation of City Hall, which we needed badly. The uh, Business Expo, I was on the council when that was established. The River Walk, the Veterans Park, Whistle Stop renovations. I was on the council that planned it and, and uh, put it out to the people to vote for. I hope I'll be there to see it finished. Um, so what I'm offering you is experience, love of the city, and I just don't want to quit. <laughs> I am not a quitter, and I want the city to grow the way the residents want it to grow, not the way the council wants it to grow, or the developers. And that's what I can guarantee that I will stand for. And thank you all for turning out tonight. Thank you, candidates. We will now be moving to the question and answer portion. There will be three minutes for response per candidate. As I said earlier, we'll be rotating. So the first to answer the first question will be Kimberly, then move on to Gigi, and then Jennifer. And we'll continue that rotation throughout. I'll be happy to repeat the question between candidates. Please ask. First question. What is the greatest single issue facing Edgewater in the coming year, and what steps, what steps would you propose to address the issue? Kimberly? I believe the biggest uh, single issue that we're facing in Edgewater is that our local government has lost the trust and confidence of the residents, business owners, developers, and employees due to a lack of perceived transparency that's resulting in political instability. We've lost the opportunity as a result of this political discourse. Project Palm withdrew from its $250 million distribution center, which would have increased our tax base by $1.5 million annually. That would have offset taxes tremendously. It took away 700 high paying jobs and a Florida Department of Economic Opportunity job growth grant for infrastructure expansion to the West Indian River Boulevard, which would have um, projected total cost of $8 million that we were due to receive as a grant. It was Edgewater's for the taking, and we lost all of that due to the political discourse. We must come together, focus, and create a vision, begin goal setting, and work harmoniously. When elected, I will listen actively, listen to learn and understand, not to argue, dispute, 
or silence critics. We need to review old charters that may be causing issues as to not create liabilities or discourse within our city. I've been working to resolve communication issues and I believe that I have found a practical solution. I would propose that we invest into a broadcast system that would allow residents to opt in to receive a pre-recorded voice or text message to allow real-time updates to our city. Thank you. Next we'll have Gigi, would you like the question repeated? No. I think the, the number one problem that we have in Edgewater, and I'm going to make it short and sweet. Gigi, could you talk in the microphone? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm going to make it short and sweet. Uh, I don't like long dissertations, but I think the, uh, building a sense of um, community, we've come apart at the seams, and we need to reestablish that stability that will encourage people to come. Right now, we're, we're not... Our reputation isn't too good, put it like that. I believe in a blending of growth with the environment. The environment's very important for us. Of course, it is for everyone, but we've got the river. And I, I believe that we need to blend the growth with the environment and not let either one interfere. We want to maintain our quality of life. That's you, right? Okay, that, that, that wasn't me. <laughs> um, I don't have a specific uh, solution for this. It's a work in progress which will take in the council and the people, the residents. You're going to have to tell us what you want. For so long we see council meetings that nobody shows up to until there's an issue. And then all the people come and they want it fixed immediately. You can't fix these problems with the government immediately. It takes sense, time, and patience. And thank you. Thank you. Jennifer, we'd like to push our feet. Nope, I'm good. Here comes the long-winded lady, folks. All right, so the greatest <laughs> issue we have facing Edgewater, I see, is development. Now, so many politicians within our county have been funded by developers, which have basically left us with undeveloped development plans all over Volusia. And I'm here to say I don't want to push out the developers, but I want them to know that this is our city. We were here first, and they have to do things our way. Mm. Now, today, one of the developers' lawyers came to my studio to talk to me because apparently I have been known as the lady who doesn't want a single house to be developed in New Smyrna, I mean in Edgewater, and unfortunately that, that I don't have that kind of power and that's not really the scheme I'm going for. You see, what I want here is smart development. Now, we are a coastal Florida town, and that means we are going to have more houses here, we're going to have more businesses, bless them, but I want to do it in a way that we don't ruin our infrastructure and that the people who are already landowners here don't end up having their land value plummet. So I feel that the development that happens here should make our city better, not worse. Smart development means I want to hold developers responsible for establishing the necessary infrastructure changes, including road and school funding and first responder funding, before the homes go in. We need a study done to make sure that we increase the impact fees appropriately. We had the recession, we had impact fees down, so now we have to increase them. We can't make it astronomical so we get sued, so we have to do a study to make sure it's appropriate. I want less 50-foot lots. I want more options. I want green conservation areas that aren't just glorified wetlands. And I want to guarantee that they're not going to put us through heck and back only to annex themselves out, become a new city, and we lose all that tax Ooh. money. It's time for us to get in front of the developers before they get in front of us. Edgewater should be able to keep its small town charm. You need that extra assistance, or if you're putting your wills together and stuff like that, and that can be costly, especially on um, you know a, a restricted income. So I would like to see us get some of these law firms together, get a program with them where they're giving some free legal help back to the environment to our um, to our elderly, so that way they can they can get things squared away, so they're not leaving burdens on their family and they feel you know at peace and at ease. Again, let's get these businesses then to help support um, some parks and rec department with the children get some more programs some tutoring so that way people don't get stuck in the cracks I would like to see more for special needs children we have a really a, a growing base of amazing special needs kids that I would like to see their parents be able to get together uh, give info to each other and um, kind of give these these parents and their kids a, a breath of fresh air and something to do so I would really like to see us to, to not only bring everybody together, I want to see us actively support each other. You know, we're, we're spending CRA money to buy pocket parks. Let's give that money to the Parks and Rec to make programs, real programs that help. Right 
Kimberly? So my three issues that I'm fighting for the citizens in our community are our water issues. Right now we have three different types of meters and some of them are failing and it's resulting in larger bills and the meter reading. I want to see us move to the IPOs that they're talking about. And I think we can do that by courting the developers that are coming in and not just have them give to the people that are coming into the area, but those of us that have been here forever. Um, so that is my number one issue. The second is transparency and accountability in government. Um, I will help restore political stability and I will root out any corruption that I find. I guarantee you that. And lastly is smart growth to foster economic development. We need to ensure smart growth, um, just as Jennifer had said, um, but as well to manage that growth and how we grow it. Um, and that will be through supporting businesses, workers, and quality life through um, tactical and strategical decisions. And um, like I said, court the developers to negotiate when they come in. Those are my three goals. Oh, wow. Thank you. We've been to the order one time. First up for this next question will be Jennifer again. Question three, how would you take steps to educate yourself regarding utility bill concerns? Here's about three minutes on utilities, folks. Buckle up. All right, so I have been listening and reading complaints about our utility department left and right. And then when you throw your hat, uh, your name in the hat to run for office, then you really get a bunch of fun messages. And, and it, you know, so here, from, from what I've gathered, from uh, not only listening to the citizens, but also being present at the workshops and the, and the meetings, we're talking about them, this is what I know we need, okay? First of all, we need new meters, just like she said. Now, we have an option right now to, and they have a five-year plan for us, for those that can wait five years for this, right? Um, for these brand new meters, and they're going to cost $114 a house. And But what's nice about them is they will show us our usage for our meters. So we will be able to log into a program and see exactly what's happening. So that way, these people on a restricted income that cannot go a dime over their allotted amount, they're going to be able to track that, and they're going to be able to nip it in the bud if anything's happening beforehand and call the city and be like, hey, I uh, see we've got a spike here, and I know that's not me. I know it's got a leak. Like, I need this fixed, and we can handle that. So I would say that needs to become a priority. Let's cut the five-year plan. Let's, let's offer an incentives for, for homeowners that want to pay for the meter outright, and we'll take it off, you know, take a little bit out of their bill as it goes on, and then let's figure out how we can afford to put it in all the rest of the houses, because that's going to be a big step of bringing the morale back. Um, second of all, we need to look into a new <coughs> billing system. Um, it seems like there's people double charge, not send bills, um, the, the, the same bill coming back around. So that to me says we're having a technological difficulty there. Um, and so I would say what we need there is a new billing system. So let's start from scratch. Again, I know it costs money, but if we're talking about, I mean, we have people on Facebook left and right bashing our city and calling into our city, bashing the employees, bless the people that take those phone calls. Um, and and we're, we're getting nowhere. We're, we're getting people that are just saying that they want to leave the city, and what does that do? So let's shell out a little bit of extra money now, so that way we square away the meters, we square away the billing system, and we can stop complaining on social media. Then we need to reevaluate these rates, because our rates are high. Yet when you look at many of the city worker salaries who are really doing this front work, they're low. So why the higher rates, and what can we do to bring them down? Let's move forward with workshops that actually break down the daily operating cost and work on ways that we can make it more effective. Part of this will be looking at a reclaimed water system, finding a more affordable way to clean it and not dumping it out to the river. Maybe it means we need more effective late fee measures. Maybe we need to check out our sanitation schedules and start making up some new routes. But there has to be a way to bring these rates down and so that way we can all live in perfect harmony. With 15 seconds left, look at that. Right on. Yeah. Kimberly, same question. So I would educate myself by reading and dissecting the rate study for a full and complete understanding. Our utility bill has four main components. That's water, sewer, refuge, and reclaim. With the addition of rooftops, we will increase water production. We are currently producing 50% of capacity. When production increases, the cost is not exponential, so the cost per gallon will decrease, producing some savings. I would like to see a cap on our sewer rate. Refuge is the most costly of the four. However, 
the people of Edgewater have spoken, and we receive outstanding service from our refuse employees, and we want to maintain a refuse service. Well, most of you know that have been around any time period that I have a, a background in accounting and having served on the city council prior, I have a very good knowledge of how the building system works. Now, the question was how would you educate yourself on, on the building system? I think that the public needs to have more precise information. When they say utility bill or the water bill, as Kim has mentioned, it's not just water, it's water, sewer, storm water, uh, refuge. Um, I know there's another one, but I can't. Um, recycling, right? Uh, so in order to maintain all of those, it's gonna cost us money. Now, there's been a lot of talk about doing a lot of things, but everything that I've heard so far is gonna cost citizens residents money and how are you going to do that I don't think our water problem is as pronounced with the meters as we believe it is because of the Facebook and, and stuff like that but I spent a good part of the morning talking to Bridget the finance director over these minute uh, these these meetings with the, the um, staff and the re the uh, water problem we do have a five-year plan to replace the meters. Some of them are at their maximum and they need to be replaced. It costs money. You want to know why your water bill went up? How are you going to get the money to pay that? They're claiming that our, city, our, our workers are not paid a decent salary. It costs money to pay them. That's all going to come out of our pockets. The water, the utility bill is, a, is an enterprise fund. That is not your ad valorem taxes. That is a consumption-run operation. So the more you use, the less it's going to cost, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, so the main thing is I just think we need to have more in-depth workshops with people to make them understand what is really going on. The nice long ones, but I think we ought to take it individually. One day it will be water, another workshop on the sewer, and why the costs are running the way they are. Thank you. Thank you. First to answer question four will be Kimberly. Question four. What do you think is the key for Edgewater to lure more jobs to the city? So I believe the key for us to lure more jobs to the city is to regain political stability and harmony. Most of you might not know, but we have site selectors that visit anonymously throughout our city and begin their evaluation and interview process well before we're ever aware of whether they are interested in Edgewater or not. Negative comments can send them packing and scouting elsewhere. We should be aware we are always surrounded by future customers. We should be consistent and develop rules and standards for all with full transparency so one potential employer visiting doesn't wonder if the last employer received more or something better than they did. It should be completely transparent for them and uh, we should continue to court developers so that we're doing the smart growth so that we're building the amount of commercial to match that of the household's rooftops and creating jobs. Thank you. Could you question again, please? Question four. What do you think is the key for Edgewater to lure more jobs to the city? The first thing I think, and it's critical, is the stability in the government. People aren't going to come if they don't feel welcomed. And that's what develops. They want a place that welcomes them openly. Now, I don't say we need to welcome them openly, but we need to set down the rules. We need to update in a structure so that we can accommodate the growth. Lower taxes so more people will want to come here. The more people, the lower the taxes. Trained workforce. We need a trained workforce to enhance these businesses to come to us. The, we need to work with the schools and, and the employees that we have, the, the companies that we have, to offer training for the businesses that would like to come. We could join a partnership with the junior college and, and 
try to work something out like that. And we need to enhance investment opportunities. And that is a developer. It's an investment when they build. So what we need to do is make them feel welcome. Businesses need to feel welcome. We need to make them feel like we want them to be part of our community. And like I said, people will come when they feel welcomed. That's it. Thank you. Jennifer, same question. So my, my, I got a kind of three-stage plan here. Uh, first, absolutely stabilize the government. I mean, that goes without saying. Right now, we need to bring everybody together. And I think no matter who we fill in this seat, I think we can all agree that stabilizing our government is priority number one. Um, but then again, I want to come back to supporting business. We, you know, I, I, I love that we have the idea of bigger stores or bigger chains coming, but really what I want to see us support is small business. I want to see US 1 and Park Avenue filled up with small businesses, so many small businesses that we have everybody and their next door neighbors an entrepreneur and they're hiring their friends and we're all just letting this cycle go on and we're going to do that. By, by, again, mandating that the CRA starts giving, you know, checks out to these business owners who are coming in, um, again, slashing that sign ordinance, which I'm going to get into in a little bit later, too. Um, and, and as a community, we need to get out there and go to those places, folks. That means you've got to eat at these restaurants that are coming in, and you've got to shop at these stores that are, shop that are coming up here. Because part of a business surviving is we actually have to be there shopping and be present. So we can't exactly order everything online and then complain that we don't have a retail store on US 1. You feel me? Um, so other than that, though, I really think ecotourism could be a big hit for us here. I think we are dropping the ball by not really, really promoting that. Um, we've gotten some great bike trails, okay? That's awesome for people who love to bike. That's a cool thing. I've never really been an outdoor girls myself, but even I want to hop on a bike and I'm nagging my husband to go get me a bike from Target so I can go check out how far <coughs> these trails go. Um, and I feel like if we could promote our river as we start taking care of it, and we can market it as a reason for people to come to Edgewater, we can promote events on our river to show people this town what we really have to offer. If we have more people utilizing our waterways and our bike trails that we created, guess what's gonna start coming next? Mom and pop shops that are selling outdoor supplies or bake shops, rentals, bike stores, sports stores. Those can be the kind of businesses that come here and thrive here. We can promote this ecotourism even further by having an app. There's an app for that, folks. So you know the Pokemon game? Anybody got kids? Anybody know what the Pokemon thing is? So they had an app, and it got kids out around town finding these little invisible creatures on cell phones and iPads. So what if Edgewater had our very own map? And it was like a treasure map, and it was this app. You could go and explore our whole town, and if you go different places, it would unlock different discounts, coupons from our sponsors, and all those good kind of things. So we're getting out there, we're telling you to check out the outdoors and feed in our ecotourism, and then come back because you're going to be hungry, you need a glass of water, you, you might need to rent a kayak or buy one next time if you're out here because you're so into it. So ecotourism, stabilizing our government, supporting our businesses, that's how we lower jobs here, folks. First up to answer this question will be Gigi. What do you think the city, not the county or the state, could do to improve the water quality of the Indian River Basin? Right, one of the things is we need more baffle boxes. For sure. We need to run reclaimed water lines to all of Edgewater, not just areas. We need to partner with adjacent cities to help keep our waterways clean. We can't do it by ourselves. We're affected by the surrounding areas. It has to be a joint partnership with the same goals. We need to set goals for what we hope to accomplish and a timetable that will keep us on track. And it will also help the people and the council realize where we are and how far we need to go and what we have accomplished. We also need to put a moratorium, if we have any, I really didn't get around to that yet, how many septic tanks we have in Edgewater. We should not allow any septic tanks in, in Edgewater. They all should be replaced. I think we're well on the way. We just did the Thomas area a couple of years ago, Thomas Street area, 
and the people were thrilled to have water, city water and sewage. The sewage was really, it was getting a lot, uh, costing a lot to empty their septic tanks. <laughs> I wouldn't want to have to do that job. Um, and we need to keep our, to, we have, well, okay, I already said that, partnership with the city, other cities, areas. We can't do it alone. That doing it alone just doesn't work. Because if, if we were isolated, it would. But it's not going to work that way. We need to get with New Smyrna, Oak Hill, and areas north of us and south of us and work in joint. I think that's one of the goals of the St. John's water management, <coughs> the rivers and all that way. But we need to do it. We need to take the initiative and form a committee or a group. Thank you. Jennifer, same question. I've got to get up in my seat because I'm excited about this one. All right, so for starters, what we need is some water goats, all right, hanging out by our storm drains. Now, for those of you that don't know what those are, these are relatively cheap, a lot cheaper than baffle boxes. They're cheap nylon nets with floating devices that basically help catch trash and debris from going into our storm drain and keeping it out of the river. Now, other cities have been able to get these things sponsored. I, in fact, bet, I bet we could, too. Uh, shout out to Libby over there. She's already reached out uh, to Publix to work on getting one sponsored by them and some other businesses. So that's something that's relatively cost effective that we can do right now, folks. And beyond that, our city needs to take this step further and find out better ways to handle our reclaimed uh, water so that we're not just dumping it out into the river. Now, yeah, we can move it short term out west and kind of put it into the ground, but eventually that will come back to bite us, too. So we need to come up with something that's going to be long term and cost effective to clean that water. Um, and like she said, I'm also going to double to get rid of all the septic tanks. That's just good for everybody. Um, we also need to take responsibility as citizens, folks. My kids and I, we go on monthly trash walks, and we go and we pick up, you know, um, trash from around the, the streets or the canals. That's what we start now. It used to be the beach to get rid of all the tourist trash. But now we focus here on Edgewater. And I use this as time to spend with my kids and to get to talk about our day. And it's something away from video games and all of that. But also, it shows this next generation firsthand what happens when you when you give into pollution. My son Jackson will tell you all about how you're, you all are killing the fishes, and eventually that's going to kill us all too. Um, so let's get some festivals, some initiatives going as a town that we sponsor, where we're giving out the gloves, where our city officials are getting their hands dirty, and we are promoting once a month that, hey, come to a town. This is the spot we're cleaning up now. Let's do this together, and then everybody can go home and, and feel like they did their piece for the universe that day. So hurrah. Um, and also, finally, can we need to push away with the fertilizer-ridden yards and push towards gardens that are supposed to actually be here. Wouldn't that be an idea? Now, William Bliss of the Sustainable Volusia is creating a plan to get cities basically promoting these gardens with native plants. And these native plants would basically mean so you don't need chemicals, and also some of them even help like filter out the, the water um, in the ground and all that good stuff. So you have pretty gardens that we're not putting chemicals in, and we have plants that are actually giving more back to us, rather than those yards, which are mostly brown half the year, and pumped filled with fertilizer. Um, as a side note, I'm on my soapbox. If you are a gardener, a botanist, you know how to write. We really are trying to move forward with that initiative to get these gardens popping up in cities all over Volusia right now so we can make a difference now, show these homeowners now how easy and affordable it would be to just start, you know, even just take a little bit of your lawn out to put in this garden, um, and we're going to help you do it. So that's my piece. Kimberly, say Repeat question. the question, please. Sure. What do you think the city, not the county or the state, could do to improve the water quality of the Indian River Basin? I believe we could improve the water quality in the Indian River Basin by expanding reclaimed water to the west. Storm water sheet flows directly into the river and unfortunately taking pollutants with it. We currently have two large baffle boxes that most of you are aware of, one in North Edgewater and another in the Riverside 442 area. If we could capture the storm water by installing smaller baffle boxes, it would make a huge difference. In addition, if we could locate and purchase some property along this area to also create additional retention storm water, uh, we believe that could also make a difference. Uh, the other thing we could do is create a public campaign for residents to add gravel and organic matter to soil 
and encourage everyone to catch runoff and rain barrels that we could use. It starts at home before we get to the government level, so we all need to do our part to protect our environment. First answer to the next question will be Jennifer. Are there any policies or procedures that you believe should be immediately addressed by the city council? Yeah, I think we're doing a great job. Just kidding! <laughs> as far as policies and procedures go, I think there's several ordinances that we could go in a muta code file, and uh, they could be better explained, they could have better repercussions, they could have more specific or be less intrusive. Uh, but so I want to start off with our sign ordinance, because like I said, that will give us instant gratification, folks. Now, this is what is prohibited in our sign ordinance, in case you haven't taken a look-see lately. No roof signs, billboards, inflatable signs, snipe signs, banners, pennants, wind-operated devices, sandwich signs, moving signs, freestanding signs, flashing signs, beacon-like signs with moving or alternating or traveling lights. Oh, and commercial mascots. <laughs> commercial mascots. Oh, yeah. Um, so basically you are limited if you open a business here to vinyl on your window and a nice big expensive monument sign that costs a couple of grand at best. Um, so I would like to go and slash all that. You know what kills me is you have all those restrictions on them. Ask me how much it cost me to put for me to put signs up. And I can put these little signs all over town and they can be up to eight square feet. Guess how much it costs? Guess how much? $28 and change, folks. That's it. And what's really the repercussion afterwards if I don't go pick up all those signs? Not a whole lot, right? So it would kind of make more sense for us to, you know, do a bond, maybe like a $300, $400 bond when we do this sign, when we apply for our sign permit. So that way, these politicians that go and put signs everywhere, they're responsible for actually taking them on back. And if you don't, well, the city will gladly do it for you as a fee. We'll take it out of the bond and we'll give you your change back, folks. Don't worry about it. Uh, so those are the two big things when it comes to signs. Um, then I want a better way to relay information to our citizens. Uh, you, how am I doing on time? Okay. Uh, when I say that, I don't just mean that we need to find new ways to get the information out to citizens. Though I did love Kim's idea of the roll call thing. The schools do that. They give me a call and a text message so I know when things are coming up. If the city could do that, it would be greatly appreciated. I could put it in my PTA calendar. We'd be good to go. Um, but other than that, we need to explain to the people what these things mean. You know, I, I had people, when I put my name in the hat here, they, would, they were messaging me asking, what does this ordinance even mean? And so now I'm spending all this time explaining this to all these people is what exactly that we're passing. So what I would like, and I don't know if we need to make another board to do this, we've got a lot of boards happening, and we could compose a board of citizens who will look at these ordinances and explain in layman's terms what they mean. So that way we can send that out in the newsletter and that out in the call home so that people actually know what it is that we're trying to pass so we're not just sweeping things right under folks. You know what I mean? All right, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Kimberly? With regard to the policies and procedures currently in place, I think our city does a fine, fine job with everything. Um, I have heard, <laughs> I have heard uh, of some policies and procedures that could perhaps be dated. Something that uh, I heard was that we had our police officers and they were doing a test and that test resulted in some damage to the car and ultimately they were responsible for a fee of a couple hundred dollars. I can't imagine taking back a few hundred dollars from an officer just for the course of trying to do their job. Um, however, I, I don't pretend to sit here and know all the policies and procedures that are in place and I believe that we have to take those one-on-one -on -one and evaluate those in today and perhaps determine whether or not they're in place, if they need to be refreshed, or if in fact they should stay. Gigi? Right. I have a couple. <laughs> and I, here again, I'm going to try to keep it short and sweet. We need to address our water quality. We need to, both in the river and the drinking water. It, it is a problem we need to look at. We need to update our land development codes uh, to reflect what we want as residents and not what the developer wants, which we can do that easy enough. We need to hire, now we've got an interim city manager, 
which hopefully will work out. But we need to hire a full-time permanent city manager. The city needs that. We are lost without the direction. The employees are going, my, my take on it is they go from day to day just getting by the day because there is no one to really lead them. We have a city manager form of government and the council cannot interfere with the running of the personnel in any way, shape, or form. It has to all go through the city manager. We need to clarify items that are not on the agenda, that we don't vote on them. We need to put that in our rules somewhere. That we do not vote on anything that is not on an agenda. We can discuss items, but no vote is taken until it is an agenda item. I think that is what really started most of this, and we need to really, I thought we all understood that, but apparently not, but we need to clarify that so the council knows what you people expect. I've heard a, I've heard a lot of, of good ideas, but please remember, these ideas are ideas, and there's a lot of money involved in a lot of these ideas. They cannot be accomplished in two years, no matter how hard you try. So you need, we need experience and somebody that knows what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. That concludes the question and answer portion. Uh, we will have a closing briefly. I would like to make an announcement that if you in the audience have questions for the candidates, we will have index cards for you to fill out. You can write your questions down. Those questions will all come back to the Chamber of Commerce and we will disperse those questions to all the candidates for their response. So you have a specific question, I encourage you to write it down. That Those questions will be dispersed to the candidates uh, in the next couple of days. The we're on a timeline, all right? We're on a timeline here, folks. We've got seven days. <laughs> right. <laughs> we now have five minutes each for closing <laughs> statements. And first up for closing will be Kimberly. Thank you so much. Um, I love our city, and I stepped up because I love our city, and I have a tremendous amount of business knowledge and I'm willing to put that forth for the city. I believe what sets me apart from my uh, opponents is the fact of the scale of business that I've handled and managed. Um, we're all business owners and I'm glad to see that there's going to be a business owner on the dais at one point. Um, but like I said, I believe what sets me apart is my experience and the scale of my experience and I can assure you I will do a wonderful job for you if elected. I hope to receive your vote, thank you. Gigi? What sets me apart, if you like experience, <laughs> I have the experience. There's no learning curve when you get up there. I can jump right in and take off. I've worked with three of the council members, the mayor, excuse me for not referring to you as the mayor, but the mayor and two other council members before. We have, I don't want to say relationship, but we know how each other works. It, we can mesh, we can, we can have our differences, and we can go on. The city needs to establish stability again, 